Hello there, my friendly battle brothers, and welcome to your weekly dose of Space Marine Chapters lore. Today's video is going to be, at the same time, the third and the final one concerning the chapter known as the Howling Griffons. We already talked about their history, their beliefs, homeworld, battle doctrine, and so on, so for today I just wanted to talk about their gene seed, a strange curse afflicting them, and some famous members of the chapter. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us finish learning about the Howling Griffons, shall we? The Howling Griffons gene seed is consistent genetically with that of other chapters from the lineage of Robot Gilliman. It is free from any known contamination, reproduces stably, and produces the full range of space marine organ implants. Because they are very active within multiple war zones, the Howling Griffons are very rigorous about harvesting and securing the progenoid glands from their fallen battle brothers. Recoveries made in the field are secured upon the very nearest chapter vessel, and then returned to Mancora for storage at the earliest possible opportunity. The sense of obligation is in large part due to the fact that the chapter has a very high rate of turnover among its members. These brave space marines prefer to engage in the thickest portion of any battle, and are almost constantly at war. Currently, records do indicate that the chapter is thankfully well supplied enough with gene seed to accommodate even its prodigious needs. Since the death of chapter master Orlando Furioso at the hands of the demon prince Pericletor, the howling griffins have fostered and nurtured a deep and unrelenting hatred of the word bearers, and a vow to seek retribution against them and their lord no matter the cost. It is a hatred that simmers in the heart of every Howling Griffin battle brother, but which can spill over in times of madness and consume them and their every thought. When the chapter's genetic curse manifests itself in an affected battle brother, it comes in three stages. Stage 1. The Price of Treachery the Battle Brother has become increasingly obsessed with the Word Bearer's treachery, and relives their fateful ambush in his mind over and over again. While this spurs him on to seek out the hated Word Bearers, it also leads him to see treachery in every place, comparing the great crime perpetrated against this chapter with other events as they unfold. The merest hint of treachery is enough to prompt a strong and violent response from the Battle Brother, one which he may not be able to control. If the Battle Brother comes into contact with a suspected traitor, he must do everything in his power to restrain himself from lashing out. If he does manage to do so, he will still be very unpleasant to the known or suspected traitor. But if he cannot, he will see it as his place to punish them, perhaps even with summary execution if the crime is great enough. Stage 2. Trail of the Traitor As the Battle Brother's hatred of the traitors grows, and his obsession with finding and exterminating the Word Bearers heightens, he will be loath to give up any mission or clue which could lead him to them. On a mission, this could mean going out of the way to seek out suspected or known traitors, or even changing the mission objectives entirely, to include their capture or destruction. In other settings, it can mean an obsessive thirst for knowledge, and seeking out dangerous texts, if it means gaining even a clue to the location and crimes of a traitor. In both instances, if the subverting of a mission or the seeking of knowledge would place the battle brother or his squad in extreme danger, he must resist the urge, unless the action pertains directly to the word bearers. Stage 3 in the Eye of Terror and Beyond. The Battle Brothers' hunger to eradicate the Word Bearers and repay them for crimes against the chapter culminates in doing whatever it takes to see them destroyed. The Battle Brother will always seek out heretic Astartes in any combat situation or mission, 
and if it falls within their power, they will see their squad face off against Chaos Space Marines as often as possible. When these hated enemies are encountered, the Battle Brother will do anything in his power to destroy them and see that they do not escape, even if it means leaving others behind or abandoning the mission entirely to chase them down wherever they might go. Long story short, it seems the Howling Griffins are literally allergic to treachery. For the second part of the video, I wanted to talk about several famous members of the chapter. Chapter Master Alvaro This guy is the current leader of the Howling Griffins. Chief Librarian Mercano Mercano fulfilled his oath of avenging Chapter Master Furioso's death by vanquishing the Demon Prince Pericletor during the 13th Black Crusade. He then led the battle barge Cerulean Claw to Vanquallis in the Obsidian System to fulfill an oath to the ruling Falcon family to defeat the Soul Drinkers who were mistakenly identified as the bearers of the Chaos Artifact called the Black Chalice. Mercano had a titanic physical and psychic duel with Sarpedon in the Soul Drinker's Space Hulk Broken Back. He broke Sarpedon's Force Staff and defeated him. However, before he could deal the death blow to Sarpedon with his Force Axe, Mercano met his demise at the hands of Eumenes, the renegade leader of the Soul Drinkers. Sarpedon then defeated Eumenes and won the leadership of the chapter back. One note I would like to make is that the 13th Black Crusade mentioned here is the AirTag's old version, and not the retcon version which was published more recently. Cadicier Miguel Gricalo In 753 M41, Cadicier Gricalo, a Howling Griffins librarian who had been seconded to the Death Watch, undertook an extended mission to investigate the watch stations of the Dark Pattern in the Jericho Rage. As most of these sites are near dead or uninhabited worlds, the motives behind their implementation remains uncertain. The librarian was motivated to undertake the study due to a series of visions that he received consistently for two years before his quest. According to records made prior to his departure, the divinations consistently told of an impending crisis that might soon emerge from this region. Several of the reports were corroborated by other psychers working in concert with the Codicier at the time. Codicier Gricalo's kill team had enjoyed tremendous success prior to his departure. Its other members, as well as the watch captain, were all reluctant to see the librarian depart on this extended solo mission. However, a missive from an unidentified member of the Inquisition provided motivation for the Watch Commander to directly order the Psyker to embark upon this journey of the Watch Stations. There have been no confirmed reports from the Codicier ever since. Routine surveys of the locations included in his route show no signs of him ever having arrived. Thus, his fate remains a mystery. Joseph Vincennes a few among Watch Fortress Ariok's compliment suggest that tactical marine brother Vincennes has launched his own crusade against the Tau of the Velkhan Sept in the Jericho Rage. After two members of his kill team were slain during a mission to investigate Tau operations on the world of Ainan, Vincennes swore an oath of vengeance against the Xenos. Since that time, he has undertaken dozens of missions into Tau-held territory. None apart from Vincent's know the precise terms of his oath, but it is clear that he is still attempting to fulfill that obligation. The other members of the kill team have been remarkably accommodating in assisting brother Vincent's, likely due to their own thirst for vengeance. Since swearing his oath, the kill team's activities against the Tau have been relentless. The majority of their time away from the worlds held by the Xenos has involved filling mandatory reports concerning the details of their missions and the threat posed by the Tau. Many suspect that Brother Vincent has become the foremost expert on the Sept's strategies and tactics within the Jericho Rage. 
However, due to his endless missions, no one has been able to compile a comprehensive report of the information he has uncovered. Dreadnought Confessor Armand Titus Chaplain Armand Titus stood as a living legend within the annals of the Howling Griffins chapter. He had been entombed within a dreadnought sarcophagus, following the fatal poisoning of his body by the wicked blades and barbs of the Dalkeldar Cabal of the Crimson Libation. Resurrected as a revered dreadnought confessor, Titus remained an inspiration to the chapter. Unwavering in his faith and a rock of conviction and righteous hate, whose wisdom and spiritual teachings shaped generation after generation of space marines. The tragic irony of Titus's long career is that when he finally fell, it was at the hands of other space marines. Awoken first from his slumber to do battle in the Caradriad sector, he remained with the Howling Griffin Strike Force as it was redeployed to serve in the Badab War. The Howling Griffins were deployed to garrison the airless moons of the Chimara system and secure them from secessionist control. At Chimara Ellipsis, they reoccupied a series of vital defense stations and listening posts. This was done with the aim of rebuilding them as a staging post for a future loyalist assault on the Badab sector itself. Although their initial efforts went unopposed, this was a course of action that put the Howling Griffin's forces directly into the path of the oncoming Executioner's Chapter the bulk of which was en route to give battle against the Loyalists in payment for the chapter's blood oath to Luft Huron of the Renegade Astral Claws chapter. Titus and his brothers were caught by a surprise assault of the entire Executioner's chapter, and were systematically destroyed by the relentless onslaught of these Astartes from an unseen quarter. As the Howling Griffin's positions were being overrun and decimated on the airless dust moon, it fell to the Dreadnought Confessor to rally them. Unafraid of the firestorm around him, with implacable zeal, the venerable Dreadnought Chaplain led the desperate counterattack, which brought his chapter the chance to regroup and mount an effective fighting defense at the cost of his long life. After the executioners had finally withdrawn from the battlefield, the surviving Howling Griffins found that their foe had honored Titus's glorious sacrifice by laying out the wreck of his sarcophagus within a ring of broken weaponry, placing one of their own shattered standards in the lifeless grasp of the fallen war machine. One of the most sacred relics of the chapter is known as the Lost Halo. This advanced Iron Halo had a long and glorious history in the Angevin Crusade, defending the mightiest heroes of the Howling Griffins from the foul Xenos infesting the Calyx Expanse. An Iron Halo, if you don't know, is a piece of equipment that emits something akin to a force field to protect the wearer. It disappeared from the chapter records after the Crusade's conclusion, and was not heard of again for many centuries. Shortly before the Jericho Warp Gate was discovered, the Omega Vault of Watch Fortress Ariok finally yielded up the Lost Halo to the Howling Griffin's Battle Brothers of the Death Watch for an unknown reason, and without any clues as to how it had arrived there in the first place. The Howling Griffin's chapter utilizes a unique color scheme that is a quartered red and yellow design. The Aquila, or Imperialis on the chest guard, is silver. The Black Squad specialty symbol on the right shoulder guard indicates operational specialty. A white Gothic numeral is stenciled in the center of the squad specialty symbol, indicating squad number. A squad sergeant sports a black helm with a red skull, and veteran sergeants adorn theirs with a white stripe. In certain circumstances, a chapter may be permitted to use a variant livery on their armor, painting it with a different design specific to an individual campaign or engagement. During some of its engagements, the Howling Griffins have been sanctioned to use such livery, giving up the bold, quartered red and yellow they normally employ. Among these official Codex-approved patterns and colors is the Nightworld Battle livery. 
a Howling Griffin's battle brother, may choose to paint his armor in Nightworld camouflage before a campaign if it will involve stealth or reconnaissance elements. The Howling Griffin's chapter badge is a black griffin rampant, centered upon a quartered field of red and yellow. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Howling Griffins for today. I hope you enjoyed learning about this chapter as much as I did making videos about them. Was this episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to help me keep the channel alive, please go check my Patreon page the link for which is in the video description. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all an amazing day. The Emperor Protects.